Product Sampling 101 – How to Collect Food Samples as Part of Outbreak Investigations This training focuses on considerations for food product sampling during foodborne illness outbreak investigations. By the end of this training, individuals should be able to sample food products appropriately and aseptically, properly record sample information, and ship samples to laboratories for product testing without compromising sample integrity. The main goal of product sampling is to identify a link between foodborne illness case patients and a food product that caused their illness. Food product sampling is very important in outbreak investigations. If a given food product sample tests positive for a pathogen of interest, laboratories can characterize those pathogen isolates through whole genome sequencing and match them to isolates from human clinical cases allowing public health agencies to determine the source of an outbreak quicker. Before you can sample, you must first identify the pathogen of interest, the establishment in which you will be obtaining samples from, and the food products you will be sampling. It is important to make sure you communicate effectively and efficiently with your epidemiological partners to obtain this information. Your partner epidemiologists and laboratorians will have data generated from interviews and laboratory specimens to form a hypothesis of a suspected establishment in one or more suspected food vehicles that could be associated with the outbreak. Knowing the potential causative agent of a pathogen you are looking for can help prepare you for product sampling. Some examples of pathogens you might be asked to collect food product samples for can include Salmonella, Campylobacter, Listeria monocytogenes, Pathogenic E. coli, Bacillus cereus, and Clostridium perfringens. Different pathogens may be associated with certain food products. For example, salmonella is commonly associated with poultry, eggs, fresh produce, and dry foods such as nuts, seeds, and spices. And Bacillus cereus is commonly associated with food that may be stored at inappropriate temperatures, allowing for B. cereus growth, such as refried beans. Some common establishments you may be asked to conduct product sampling in include retail stores, including deli counters or delicatessens, restaurants, and other eateries, as well as other facilities such as hospitals, nursing home, long-term care facilities, schools, and more. You may also be instructed to sample one specific food product type or multiple different foods. It is also important to communicate with your epidemiological partners about the type of food products you will be sampling. Some common examples of food products you may be instructed to sample include deli meats and cheeses, fresh cut fruits and vegetables, sushi or sashimi products, and leftover buffet items. In most investigations, open food product samples will be available for sampling. For example, salad ingredients taken from a salad bar. You may also be asked to collect intact or unopened product samples as well. In particular, taking an unopened intact sample could help identify if a product was contaminated prior to entering an establishment. Overall, it is important to communicate with your local and state health department partners about whether both open and unopened or intact product samples would need to be taken. Sometimes you may also be asked to collect environmental samples at the same time you collect food samples. For guidance on collecting environmental samples, please refer to the Environmental Health Quick Train videos published by the New York Food Safety Center of Excellence. When conducting an outbreak investigation, you do not have to notify an establishment that you are coming. Food product samples should be collected as soon as you identify a suspected food product. During your investigation, the establishment should be notified of the food product samples you are collecting and the reason that you are collecting the food product samples. Before the food product sampling event, make sure the partnering laboratory is informed. They may need to have specific reagents, supplies, and additional staffing for processing samples. Communicate with the laboratory and develop a plan with your investigating team prior to sample collection about what the sample is that will be collected, when the sample collection event will occur, how sample collection will be performed, and estimated quantities of samples that will be collected. 
It is important to communicate the sample collection plan with your laboratory partners prior to the sampling event. After determining what products you will be sampling, you will need to select the proper supplies. Follow this checklist for the usual tools needed to collect a sample. This image shows examples of supplies you may need when collecting samples. Here you can see a world pack bag and sterile sampling tools, a probe and infrared thermometer, tape, permanent markers in the sampling checklist, a notepad, sanitizing wipes, a cooler that will be the proper size to fit your samples and ice packs, and gloves and a hairnet. Upon arriving to collect samples, your investigation team should present their agency credentials to the establishment. Prior to collecting any food product samples, it is important to wash and sanitize hands and apply gloves if collecting non-packaged items to ensure aseptic sample collection practices. It is best to collect food products in their original state and container. For example, this entire meat shove shown below in its original packaging. Submitting the product in its original packaging can be essential for ensuring lot code information is preserved, which can be important for facilitating follow-up regulatory actions. You may also need to take a subsample or a portion of a food product when conducting product sampling. For example, taking slices of an open meat chub rather than taking the entire meat chub. Subsamples need to be collected in an aseptic manner to avoid potentially contaminating the product. If you don't have sterile disposable tools on hand for sample collection, you can use the establishment's utensils and equipment such as knives, tongs, and cutting boards to aid in sample collection. Be sure to first clean and sanitize them with your own cleaning and sanitizing chemicals. For example, you can use your own disinfecting and sanitizing wipes to thoroughly disinfect the surface of the establishment's utensils you plan to use, as well as cutting boards you plan to cut the meat chub on. Here we are sampling an open food product. Use knives to cut into the food product and collect a subsample. Use tongs to place the subsample into a sterile leak proof bag that is appropriately labeled. After collecting subsamples, you will want to thoroughly clean and sanitize any of the establishment's utensils and equipment you use for subsample collection as well as the workspace you used. If you are collecting a very large intact sample, such as a meat chub, you can take its temperature with an infrared thermometer and take the temperature of the cold storage unit it is in to verify the temperature of the unit in relation to the product. Ensure the product is kept at the same or similar temperature it is intended to be at throughout transport. If ice packs are being used, be sure they are sterile and surround the product with them so that the sample does not come in contact with anything in the outside environment. Avoid using any tools or thermometers that could poke any sort of holes or cause harm to an intact product, as this will lead to it no longer being an intact sample. However, if you need to take temperature using a probe thermometer, this can be done on an open food product if need be. After collecting subsamples, Ensure that the establishment places a placard by the portion of the food product you are leaving at the establishment, clarifying that the particular food product should not be used under the assumption that it is contaminated until after laboratory testing results are obtained and relayed to the establishment. However, the final decision on this may be up to the establishment depending on your applicable regulations in your jurisdiction. Label each sample container with the sample type, any associated outbreak number if applicable, the date and the time of collection. The following supplies should be included in the sampling container. An absorbent pad, cold packs, cardboard separator, Ziploc bags containing the sampling checklist and other relevant paperwork such as chain of custody forms. When preparing to ship your samples, make sure you double check the shipping label to make sure it is going to the correct lab and that your shipping container does not have any additional expired shipping labels on it. 
It is the default that food product samples should be transported to the laboratory under the same or similar conditions in which the food was intended to be in to prevent any changes to microbiological condition during collection, storage, and shipping. The temperatures do not have to be maintained exactly the same from collection to shipping. For example, if a food product is collected frozen, we want to maintain and ship it frozen, unless the lab we are working with recommends otherwise. If it is collected refrigerated, we want to maintain and ship it refrigerated. Freezing a refrigerated food could affect the microorganisms present. So, if the food is at 40 degrees Fahrenheit or refrigerated when collected, and that is the proper temperature to store that food, ensure that it is also stored around 40 degrees Fahrenheit during transport. However, if the food is at 1 degrees Fahrenheit when collected, but it was intended to be refrigerated at negative 4 degrees or below, ensure that it is stored at a temperature that is around negative 4 degrees Fahrenheit during transport. If the food is at room temperature during collection, it may need to be transported under refrigeration conditions to prevent pathogen proliferation during transport, depending on the pathogen that the laboratory will be testing for and the food product. For example, if products are to be tested for Bacillus cereus and you collect a food product that is on a steam table, these products should be refrigerated immediately to prevent further bacterial growth. On the other hand, if you are testing for salmonella in dry flour stored without refrigeration, you do not need to refrigerate it because it is very unlikely that the pathogen will grow in the dry matrix at room temperature. The investigator is then responsible for shipping samples. Avoid shipping samples on weekends and federal holidays. It is important for the investigator to communicate with the lab about the product sampling results. Product sampling results should be communicated to the establishment as soon as they are obtained. Overall, communication is highly important for all organizations across the board. Make sure that you are adequately prepared before you begin product sampling procedures. Specifically, make sure to know what pathogen you are looking for and anticipate what tools you will need. Once you know what tools you need, bring all of them. Always ensure that you are sampling appropriately and aseptically. It is important to document key things about what you are sampling, such as temperature of the fridge and the date a sample was taken. Taking multiple food product samples at a time may be necessary, as well as taking multiple subsamples of one food product. Most importantly, be sure to use aseptic practices when collecting any type of food product sample in order to avoid cross-contamination. Further, Make sure that all samples are packed so you can deliver them in a similar condition to the lab where they were originally obtained. Communication across all parties involved in an outbreak investigation is key, including the lab, epidemiology, and environmental health partners. Make sure to always communicate with the establishment that you are sampling at. Following this, you are then responsible for obtaining results from the lab. When results are obtained, make sure to convey them to the establishment. This training on food product sampling is vastly important for identifying the source to outbreak investigations within local establishments. By using these steps for product sampling, you will be able to help identify the source of an outbreak and prevent others from getting sick.